Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming September of 2016 premiere auction. And I'm very happy to get a chance to take a look at a Japanese copy of the ZH-29 rifle. There are, well they only made 10, maybe 12 of these in the first place, and this dates to Japan's pre-World War II experimentation with self-loading rifles. Now, like pretty much all substantial military powers, Japan uh, spent a bunch of time in the 1920s and 30s investigating the possibility of semi-automatic combat rifles. Everyone pretty much wanted them, nobody was willing to pay for them. Kind of see the dilemma. Now throw into that that nobody had really, in the 1930s people were still trying to figure out how exactly to build a semi-auto military rifle that would be strong enough to be durable and accurate enough to be usable cheap enough to be affordable and also light enough to be practical. So there were a lot of balancing issues that were going on and a lot of engineers were working on this problem. Well, Japan was no different and in 1932 Japan had, well, let me back up a bit. Um, dating back as early as like the early 1920s, Kijiro Nambu, uh, one of the most famous of the Japanese firearms designers, had been experimenting with semi-auto rifles, presenting some to the military, in the early 1930s, they started doing formal competitive trials. And in 1932, they brought in uh, two additional companies to join uh, Nambu's own work. Those companies were uh, Nippon Special Steel and Tokyo Gas and Electric, or TGE. Now, TGE was a, a big overarching industrial concern. Um, they did all sorts of different things, including heavy industry manufacturing, like firearms. So, uh, the Japanese were particularly interested in the American Pedersen rifle. Uh, in fact, the Japanese, one of the Japanese army arsenals would, shortly after 1932, start uh, making its own copy of the Pedersen. Uh, Nippon Special Steel, had a, their chief designer was a guy named Dr. Kawamura. He really liked the toggle lock action and he designed his own uh, gas operated toggle locked gun, which by the way, we did a video on one of those. If you're interested, you should check that out. Uh, we also did a video on the army Japanese Army's version of the Pedersen, so you can check that one out as well. The third competitor here was TG&E, which took the Czech ZH-29 rifle and basically just copied it. They made an, a few small changes to it, but nothing really mechanically substantial. Um, the ZH-29 is an interesting rifle in that it was one of the earliest practical semi-auto military rifles out there, uh, obviously 1929. It was a remarkably light gun, uh, and yet Strong, fired the standard 8mm Mauser cartridge, and it was tested by people all over the planet. Uh, nobody, well, a few countries bought them, nobody bought more than a few hundred of them, unfortunately for the factory in Brno where they were manufactured. But it was a really interesting gun. In United States trials, it was the rifle that kind of broke the stereotype of a semi-auto rifle having to weigh 10 pounds or more. The ZH-29 came in at 8, 8.5 pounds, and it Really, a remarkable achievement for 1929. So, the Japanese decided to copy it. Now, TG&E didn't really have an engineering staff, or they didn't have a design staff. So, they copied the rifle, but when it had some problems, they weren't really, apparently, from what I can tell, they weren't really able to figure out the root cause of the problems, so they weren't able to fix them. And primarily, this was a problem with accuracy. Now, the first Japanese rifle trial was held in 1933, and, uh, the ZH-29, we don't know much about. Uh, I haven't been able to find any information really about how it performed in that first trial, although I think I'd be safe going out on a limb and saying it probably had some accuracy issues. Uh, the Nippon Special Steel Rifle had some problems. Uh, nothing really worked perfectly. So the Japanese, the, the Army said, okay, go do some more development. They came back in 1935 for a second round of trials. And in that one, we know for sure the ZH-29 copy had substantial accuracy problems. Now it seems that that uh, stems from the fact that it only has one locking lug. Now it's certainly it's plenty big enough to be safe, but it's one offset locking lug on the side of the bolt. And that contributes to some offset issues. You get vibrations, you get harmonics. Um, what's much better for accuracy is to have the, the force of the, the pressure from firing equally supported all the way around the circumference of the uh, case. The, for example, the AR-15, which has locking lugs all the way around uh, the chamber, it's a remarkably accurate rifle in general. 
Uh, ZH29 has just one lug sitting off the side. It had problems. Now, presumably it had these problems in the first trial. They tried to fix them, came back in the second trial, hadn't managed to make a dent in the problem. And after this 1935 trial, TG&E dropped out of the competition. That left the Tokyo Army Arsenal and Nippon Special Steel to compete. Um, you can hear about those stories in detail in the other two videos. The short version is they never adopted any semi-auto rifle before World War II because their fighting in China really kind of took on a, a higher pitch and they decided that the money being spent on the developmental process was really better spent making a whole lot of Type 38 Arasakas, which they already had well in hand. They were a lot cheaper. They, they were reliable. Everyone knew they worked. Better to stick with those than to get experimental and risky trying to develop a semi-auto rifle on short notice. So the program ultimately died, as did most of the semi-auto rifle programs before World War II. The U.S. and Russia are really two of the standout um, oddballs for having actually finished and adopted a self-loading rifle during that time. Anyway, why don't we go ahead and pull this apart. These are actually quite easy to field strip, and on this one I can actually take everything off the barrel and show you what's under there, which is pretty cool. All right, we'll start with a few basic things here. This is, of course, a semi-automatic rifle. It has a magazine on the bottom, which is unfortunately missing. Now, the standard ZH-29 magazine is interchangeable with the ZB-26 light machine gun magazine. However, the Japanese redesigned this. It is chambered for 6.5 Japanese, which is a shorter cartridge, and they designed their own magazine, and a standard ZH-29 mag does not fit. So that's a dilemma someone will have to solve. It is gas operated. We have a uh, bolt handle here. Now this is actually one of the things that the Japanese changed. Originally the ZH-29 had a more open receiver and the bolt handle was fixed onto the side of the bolt. In fact, I just happen to have a standard production ZH-29 here uh, so that we can compare. And you can see the bolt here works the same way but they put the bolt handle right on the side. The whole receiver is wide open here until you get to this point. The Japanese, however, enclosed the bottom half of the receiver here. Uh, presumably they were trying to make it a little bit less amenable to dirt getting inside, which is a good idea. Um, and they put the bolt on the outside. It's a separate piece running in a track here. And it is actually a non-reciprocating bolt handle. So when the bolt locks back, slide the bolt handle to the front, whereas on the standard guns it is of course reciprocating because it's fixed to the side of the bolt. Now, one of the interesting features of the ZH-29, and this, this was used on some other early rifles of this period, but there is no bolt release control. We got no controls at all on this side. Over here, you've got a magazine release and a safety, and that's it. In order to release the bolt, which, by the way, locks open when empty here, even if you don't have a magazine in it, uh, you actually pull the trigger. So first trigger pull closes the bolt, second trigger pull fires the rifle. This is something that we would probably consider hazardously unsafe today, but if you think about it from a, a bit of an objective military perspective, you've got one less control for troops to have to mess around with and figure out, and this, this is kind of a, a natural, easy to, easy to learn process. You put in a new magazine and, well, what are you going to do to start shooting and start pulling the trigger? So I think it makes sense in that context. Now, the original ZH-29s had a standard uh, tab magazine release. In fact, we'll take a look at one here briefly. So normally you push in the tab and it's a nose-in rock-back magazine. Pretty, pretty standard there. The Japanese changed that a bit and they actually have a push-down uh, magazine release. So you, you push that down to pull the magazine out. And you can see it opens up that locking lug there. Now, it's also interesting to point out the ZH-29 actually has two magazine catches, one at the front and one at the back. You can see that spring-loaded. In addition to this one at the back, uh, there is no catch for the front one, or uh, no latch for it. Uh, when you release the rear one, it allows you to rock the magazine out and disengage it from the front catch. The safety is very simple, sitting right here in front of the trigger. That's safe. That's fire. We have this Japanese character. One of the few necessarily external hints that this is a Japanese rifle. Um, I am assuming that that says safe, but I don't actually read Japanese. The only external mark we have on this is a serial number eight 
here on the back of the receiver. We'll see that repeated on the inside on most of the parts. Uh, there is no uh, model, make, year, proof mark, no designations like that anywhere on here. Now one last control, we have a gas adjustment uh, regulator up here and I don't honestly know. We've got characters there that mean something and we've got a uh, character here on the bottom as well. You can see the, the serial number 8 repeated. Uh, we will be pulling this piece off so you'll be able to see how that works internally in just a moment. The front sight is a pretty standard big triangular post, uh, very similar to Arasaka's at the time. Maybe, well, a little bit bigger, but same style. And then lastly we have the rear sight here. So this is actually kind of cool. This dial elevates the rear sight. There's an elevation um, catch and ratchet in there. And this allows me to just lift it up to whatever range I find appropriate. Then this little dial adjusts windage. Oh, there you go. You can see the, the ratchet teeth here. There's a gear underneath built into the receiver on this side. All right, disassembly of the ZH-29 and the Japanese copy is super easy and cool. There are two pins that hold the upper and lower together. You can see them here on this side as well. All I have to do for field stripping is pop the top pin, which you would probably push with a cartridge. There we go. Comes all the way out. And then with a little bit of judicious wiggling. Mm -hmm. There we go. Now, the rifle simply breaks in half like this. With the rifle broken open like this, I can now pull out the bolt and the operating rod. The charging handle is going to come back to here and then lift off. And then I can just pull the bolt out, although I have the locking pin in the way. There we go. So there is our bolt bolt carrier, and gas piston. Those, we'll take a closer look at those in the moment, but in the meantime, I want to take the lower completely off the rifle. So all I have to do for that is push out the bottom pin as well, right there, and then the lower lifts completely off. All right, so here's our bolt and its carrier, and this is going to tilt like this. So pushed with the pushing on the bolt face, this comes back like that. This is the locked firing position. Now I mentioned the one locking surface, and that is right here on the back side of the bolt. That is going to lock into a locking shoulder recess in the receiver, which is located right there. So that surface on the bolt locks against that surface that keeps it in place. Then we have our gas piston here, which is on this long operating rod, which is connected directly to the bolt handle. When that gas piston uh, is pushed backwards from firing, the operating handle is going to pull back like this. And at that point, this hook catches right there, and that's going to pull the bolt in that direction, which unlocks it. Once it's unlocked, then the whole thing travels backward to cycle. The ZH-29 firing system, the trigger mechanism is quite simple and cool. Um, this isn't quite identical to the Czech version. It's actually a little bit simplified. Um, and this is actually really slick here. Now this lug right here is what locks the bolt open. So you can see how the first trigger pull like that will lock the bolt. And then when you fire, this hook simply lifts off of that hook, which releases the hammer. Now there is a disconnector down in the bottom, which is hard to see. That guarantees that when, if you hold the trigger down when you're firing, when the hammer gets pushed back by the bolt, this hook will catch on the disconnector on the bottom, cause the hammer to hold back, and thus only fire semi-automatic. When you release the trigger, now this hook engages and that holds it. The mainspring for the rifle is actually right here. This runs down into the stock but you can see we have a plunger right there, and that is going to act on the tail of the bolt carrier. So that plunger acts on this surface right here, 
like that. Now, in addition, there's also this guy, which is a much heavier spring, and it's just a little bit of a buffer, um, a spring buffer at the end of travel, so that what remaining velocity is in the operating rod and the bolt, they don't just slam into the back of the receiver, they hit this, which I don't know if I can even, I can't even push it in with my thumb to show you, it's, it's very stiff. All right, now the really cool part, let's take off the front end of the rifle. You wouldn't normally do this for field stripping, but because I can, I'm going to show you. So, first off, the cleaning rod is down here underneath the barrel. It is locked in place by this cammed lever, uh, so you would rotate that 180 degrees. You can see a little mark on the barrel, just barely there, where people have done that over the past, what, 80 years. Um, however, I don't actually need to take that out, and it's tight, so I'm just going to leave it in place. What I am going to do is unscrew this threaded front section. This is what actually holds all of the handguard and the gas system and the front sight onto the gun. So with this off, now we can pull other things off. So we can pull off the gas block here. So that's going to come off with the cleaning rod on it because I didn't take it out. Actually, I should probably take it out right now. So there's that lever. We'll rotate it around. Now the cleaning rod comes out. All right. So here's our gas block. This just sleeves over the barrel. And then that hole is for the cleaning rod. This is the beginning of our actual gas piston. So the bolt carrier fits right in there like that. Now this is going to adjust the amount of gas getting into the system. You can see this hole, this is where they drilled, they drilled from this side down through the gas block into right there. So you can see the gas port right there in the gas block. So I should also mention that there is this lever, and honestly, I have no idea what this does. I thought it would lock the gas piston, gas system, but it doesn't. It's rotating in that hole. Um, you got me. I think it's, maybe that, that was an early way that they were looking at retaining the uh, cleaning rod, because that's what goes through there, but that doesn't appear to do anything. So, don't know. We'll leave that alone. However, on the back here, we've got gas port, barrel. It is keyed at the top so that it can't rotate off center. Next up, we can take off the front section of handguard, which has, again, the same three holes, barrel, gas piston, cleaning rod. And these screws just hold the metal uh, end segments onto the wooden piece. And then we can take off the rear section of the handguard. You can see there's this interesting uh, kind of vent shroud sleeve on the barrel, and then the barrel is threaded into the receiver here at the end. This section of handguard is just a handguard. So there you have it guys, one completely disassembled Japanese ZH-29 copy from the Tokyo Gas and Electric Company. So a couple quick questions I know people are going to ask. The first off is why are the sights offset? Well. That was actually a thing that was done on the original ZH-26s, or 29s, as well as the Japanese copy. There's an interesting side effect of the bolt being a side tilting mechanism, which by the way is very unusual. Um, first off, you can take a look here, you can see how this works. When I unlock the bolt, you can see it pivots out to the side, and then back. Well, because of this, you actually want, you want the bolt face, when the bolt is locked, to be exactly perpendicular to the face of the barrel. You don't want the bolt uh, and the barrel to be at an angle like this. You want them flush against each other, which means since the bolt is comes straight up and then tilts, the barrel is actually offset to the left from the bottom. It's offset to the right when we look at it from the top. So on the Japanese rifle, it's actually a little bit subtle and difficult to see, but if you look closely there, um, while the handguards are in line parallel to the action, the barrel's actually pointing slightly off to the right. 
and to account for that they offset the, the sights to the left. So uh, the rear sight here is actually farther off to the left than the front sight is, which means that your line of sight is exactly parallel to the barrel and not parallel to the action of the gun. So that's why the sights are offset. So this offset feature is actually much more noticeable on the Czech ZH-29s uh, just because of a different handguard design. But yeah, if you look at this one, boy, it, that barrel just looks totally bent, doesn't it? It's not. It's actually a perfectly straight barrel. It's just not a barrel that's exactly parallel uh, to the receiver because of that side tilting bolt. Thank you for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm really happy to have gotten a look at this now being the third of the four Japanese semi-auto prototypes that were in these 1930s trials. So hopefully I will get a chance to find an example of one of Nambu's rifles. But until then, uh, very cool to see this one and understand exactly how it works. If you'd like to own it yourself, unfortunately it is missing the magazine, but uh, I'm sure a motivated person could come up with a solution to that problem. If you take a look at the description text below, you'll find a link to Rock Island's catalog page on this guy. You can look at their pictures, their description, and uh, if you decide it's something you want to invest in, you can place a bid right through the website, over the phone, or here in Rock Island, live at the auction. Thanks for watching.